Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Evangel Online. I'm Pastor Aaron, and if you're joining us for the very first time, welcome to church here at Evangel. We are in week two of our annual State of the Church series, and we have our annual State of the Church survey available for everyone to complete. If you call Evangel Home, whether it's here in person or online, you're connecting with us, we would love to hear from you, and it would be very helpful for us as a leadership as we cast some vision and plan what's in store for 2021, and uh, we would love to hear from you, and so you can fill out the annual State of the Church survey uh, Uh, by simply going to our website, evangelyarmouth.com, scrolling down to the bottom and clicking on the box that says State of the Church Survey. We are starting up another round of foundations here at Evangel, and uh, if you are at all curious of what foundations is or it, how you can get involved, maybe you have some questions about your faith and uh, or, or you're interested in getting further involved here at Evangel, uh, this is an in-person um, group that gets together on Sunday afternoons and we explore different topics such as baptism, uh, membership here at Evangel, and other things like that, how to get involved further. So if you are at all interested, please send us a message here on Facebook or get in contact with the church office by phoning in or, of course, stopping in at any point to chat with uh, one of the pastors here. We'd love to get you plugged into Foundations if that's an interest of yours. We also had a couple really cool things happen in the last week. Last Wednesday, we started our first week of food and fun boxes, and uh, we had about 40 boxes full of groceries and other items that we put together and went and delivered out to families in the community. And so if you helped with that, thank you for coming out on Wednesday and doing that, whether you put them together or went out to deliver them. Uh, Thanks for your help, and we're really excited for doing this again later on in February. And we also had our first week of free meals here at Evangel. And uh, we every Tuesday, we are giving out free meals uh, here at the church. And uh, so if you are in the Yarmouth area and you could really use a uh, hot meal uh, on Tuesday, we are doing lunch this week from 12 to 1. Uh, so this Tuesday, and uh, if, if you could really use a meal, come by the church, uh, 1 Myrtle Street right here in Yarmouth, and stop by um, and get a free meal. Simple as that. Or maybe you know somebody who could really be blessed by a meal. Uh, come and pick one up and, and go bring it to them. And uh, this is just a great way we can practically meet some needs in our community and uh, just bless one another with, with some food. And uh, it's a great thing. So if you're planning on stopping by and uh, grabbing a meal, uh, you don't have to, but it would be helpful for us so that we know how much food to make if you signed up and let us know that you're coming. And you can simply do that just by contacting the church office and phoning in to let us know you're coming. So we look forward to seeing you on Tuesday for lunch. I invite you now to join us as we sing and worship the Lord together tonight. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome this morning. We're a church that worships the Lord together. We're a church that we look to the word together and we dig in deep with God together. But we're also a church that celebrates our wins together. Last Sunday, we spent some time praying for everyone at the altar, and uh, Marie Smith came forward with a lot of pain in her back. She said she was having a lot of pain. It was hard to get out and about and move around, and we were able to pray with her, and at the end of the prayer, I asked her how she was feeling, and she said the pain is completely gone. So not only did God heal her pain in that moment, but two days later, I asked her, I said, Marie, how you feeling? Because I seen her in the office. She said, I haven't had pain in my back since Sunday at church. Praise the Lord, church. This is just one of the many things that God is doing in this place and in our lives and in our hearts. And I don't know about you, but just hearing about these victorious things, hearing about God doing these things just gets me really excited. Makes me excited to worship Him this morning. So let's join together. Sing this one, Joy Unspeakable. Come on, bud, would you lead us today? I have found His grace is all complete. He supplied every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free as free.
Die. 
see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop to clear today. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you working. Even when I don't feel it, you working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, yes you are.
the way maker and miracle worker. Lord, we pray for those who cannot make it this morning for whatever reason, that wherever they find themselves today, they would find themselves near to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we can lift up this praise to you. Good morning, folks. Welcome. Welcome to Evangel Assembly this morning. How have the first couple of weeks of your new year been so far? Has it been thumbs up, first couple of weeks of the new year? Pretty good? Pretty good? Oh, I see some thumbs down. That's okay, too, you know? First, first couple of weeks been pretty good of the new year. That's, that's good. That's, that's a good thing. Pastor Aaron and I were, were joking earlier this week. We, we saw some memes online that said, you know, wishing people happy new year. And then someone interjects and says, no, the, the happiness of the new year has yet to be determined. And if we look back to last year, we can only imagine uh, the things we had no idea that were coming. But despite it all, the Lord has been faithful. And the Lord has seen us through 2020, and here we are in 2021. This is week two of our State of the Church Address for 2021. Now, last week, if you were with us last week when we started off, I, I, I laid the groundwork of a few things. I said that this year, even though it's a new year, it's 2021, our calendars have flipped over, we've got new ones. Even despite all of that, we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And what God has been doing and what he's been up to in the fall is not just tossed out the window and forgotten in the favor of something new for a new year, but instead, we're going to continue to press in to what the Spirit of God has been doing and what we have been hearing and to continue to experience God in our gatherings. And wasn't it a fantastic testimony Pastor Aaron shared this morning about prayer last Sunday? Wasn't that fantastic? I believe that was at the 11 o'clock gathering where, where Marie was. And there's so many other ways that God touches and God moves and God does things, things that may not even make it to our understanding, things that are just deep within people's hearts. And so I want us here at Evangel, just to, in 2021, as we start the year, just to have a culture of celebrating some of those small things. We know the Word of God tells us in the Old Testament prophets, do not despise the day of small beginnings. I preach that passage every September as I have ever since I arrived. It was the first passage I preached from Zechariah when I came here. And so let's honor that. And let's continue to press on and see what the Lord has. Because here's the thing, folks. I think that sometimes, and maybe it's just me, but I think that sometimes we can become preoccupied with what we, what we, what we seem to think God isn't up to and what he isn't doing. And sometimes we can spend our focus there, trying to explain what is not happening. And when we do that, we usually end up concluding that we've probably received everything that God has for us and we, and we, and we close down any further pursuit. But when we settle like that, when we develop theology, Theologies like that, it leads us into just a contentment, maybe an apathy that robs us of contending for more, of waiting for more of what the Lord might have. You remember in the New Testament, the prophetess Anna. She was an old lady and she was a prophet all of her life. And she had a promise that she held in her heart that she would see the Messiah before she died. Do you remember her? Do you remember that? You see, it was a long time between that promise in her heart and her actually seeing the Messiah. And, and she could have left at any time. She could have just developed an understanding, a rationalization that ah, I, I heard wrong or maybe, maybe this is the best it, it gets for me. And, and she could have just walked away and, 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 and retired from her life as prophetess in the temple, but she would have missed seeing the Messiah at the 11th hour. And so I want us this year 
to be like the Apostle Paul encourages the church in Corinth to eagerly desire spiritual things, to set our eyes and our face toward what God is doing, to celebrate when we see the kingdom of God manifested in our, in our gatherings and in our lives outside of our gatherings, to celebrate when we see people confessing faith in Christ. And, and we will talk about, you know, the, the fact that sometimes we don't always experience this, but that won't be where we place our whole heart and our whole mind because we have no idea the extent to which God will reach down and bless today. We don't know the extent. We just know that someday Christ is going to return and then it all comes, all the fullness of blessing without shadow, without veil, without hiddenness. So as I encourage you with that this morning, if you have a Bible with you, you can open to the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament, probably quite near the middle of your Bible, Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to walk our way through the first 14 verses this morning of Ezekiel chapter 37. This might be a familiar passage for some of you this morning, especially if you have been part of a local church for some time. This might be familiar with you. It is the, it is the vision of the valley of dry bones. But let's pray before we jump into this this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you this morning for who you are. And we thank you this morning that we can come and in the presence of worship, burdens can be lifted. Joy can be imparted into our hearts. And so I thank you, Lord God, that you are the way maker. I thank you that we can praise your name forevermore. And I thank you that when we do that, it changes things around us. It changes things in us. So take these words, Lord, in this prophetic book of Ezekiel that we are about to look into and help them to change again the atmosphere in our lives and in our hearts. We thank you for this. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. This, this vision that Ezekiel has here in Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones, it's, it's one that if you've heard it before, it can be summed up pretty quickly. But there's some deeper stuff we're going to dig into this morning. At the surface, this is what it says. Ezekiel was taken into a valley, and he saw the valley was full of bones, and the bones came to life again. They had flesh and tendons put back on them, and they, they became active again. But there's some more here that we can dig into. So let's start with verse 1. Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Folks, he says that the hand of the Lord was on him and the Spirit of the Lord brought him out. How many folks know this morning that the Spirit of God still speaks today with visions and dreams and, and impressions in all sorts of ways? How many know that and believe that this morning? How many of us believe what Joel, the prophet, said in Joel chapter 2, that, that we would see visions and dreams, old and young, slave and free, male and female, and that was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 because Peter said so in the word of God. And so how, how many of us know this morning that that is still true and valid for us today? And so when we see this, we don't know the, the, the mechanism by which it happened. We don't know where Ezekiel was, but we know that the Spirit of God impressed this upon Ezekiel. It seems to be in a way that even Ezekiel saw things, just didn't, didn't think things. Uh, he, was, he was brought out of, of wherever he was, maybe out of his body, out of his area, and he was shared something by the Lord. He saw in the valley bones. And it was full of bones. Verse 2 says, He led me back and forth. The Spirit of God led Ezekiel back and forth 
among the bones. And he says, I saw a great many on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Bones that were very dry. You see, folks, these bones that Ezekiel saw, they they had been there for a time. They weren't just put there recently. It wasn't that the, the, the bones to the structures they belonged to, it wasn't that they had recently died. They had been there a while because they were dead and they were dry. At Christmas time, when we had a turkey this year, it's always my job, I don't know why, to take care of the bones and, and the leftovers and, and, and the carcass. And so this year we've learned our lesson. But in previous years, I just took the bones and everything and the roaster and just dumped it in the green bin in the backyard. Just dumped it straight in, just, just that way. And here's the thing about fresh bones. Well, there was, they were wet and they had meat on them and there was still some, some skin. And apparently the smell of that, who, who would have known? The smell of that attracts critters. Mice and rats and other things that feel like they want to come have a meal. I mean, who would have thought, eh? Apparently, I didn't think. And, and they chewed right through the mesh grate on the bottom of my green bin. They got inside and they ate themselves so big they couldn't fit back out. And so they died in my green bin. And they attracted friends of theirs who died on the sidewalk around the green bin. So I have to say a special public thank you to two people who rescued me from this disaster in my backyard. I have to say thank you to my oldest son, Ben, who is here this morning. Because my oldest son, Ben, with the only payment being the promise of a Big Mac meal if he did this, went out with a shovel and picked up all of the deceased critters I don't even know where he put them. doesn't matter. They're out of sight, out of mind. And he took the old green bin with, I don't even know what was inside, and drug it up to the road. So thank you, Ben. I would have given you a Big Mac a day for a week, but we settled on a Big Mac meal, and, and you did that for me. That was awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that, Ben. And then the second person who rescued us is also here in this room. I have to thank Sabrina Fevens, who works for the town of Yarmouth, who we called and said, Sabrina... We need a new green bin, and we need this old one gone as fast as you can get it gone. And so Sabrina sent her workers over to collect the broken and disgusting green bin, and we have a new one. And we wrap bones in paper now, and we have green bin liners, and I'm going to pressure wash my green bin out again in the spring and keep it nice, nice and tidy. Some people, apparently I might be one of those people, like to learn lessons the hard way. And so I've learned my lesson. So these bones that Ezekiel was talking about, they were dry. They weren't just dumped there in the valley like the bones I dumped in my green bin. They were dry. They had been there for a while. And moreover, they were the bones of not just anybody, but they were, just, they were bones of people who even in their life were disgraced people, less thought of people because in Jewish culture and custom, you wouldn't just discard a corpse into a valley to let it rot and have the bones exposed. That would be... Someone who is disgraced or disregarded. And so given all of this that's built up against these bones and the people who once were part of them, we read this in verse 3. The Spirit of the God, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Ezekiel answered, O sovereign Lord, You alone know. Only you know, God. What a clever and polite answer that was. Because the answer in the natural is, of course not, right? I mean, how many of us have dumped our turkey bones in the green bin to find out the next morning we have a turkey running around the backyard again? The bones came back together. We had other things running around the backyard, Ben, but it wasn't the turkey. I mean, that would be kind of handy. Just dump your green bin bones in and next day get the turkey back and cook it again. And, you know, but, but dead and dry bones in the natural, they don't, they don't come back again. And so what a clever answer, Ezekiel. Ah, uh, uh, Lord, only, only you know. 
And then the Lord said to him, verse 4, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. The Lord said, Ezekiel, prophesy. Prophesy to the bones. Folks, what does it mean to prophesy? It's a Greek word, and in this case, it's Hebrew, and it's transliterated into English. It just means this. To prophesy means to speak the word of God for the moment. A prophecy is a timely word from the Lord. Prophecy can have a predictive element like like future events like we read in apocalyptic literature in here in the scriptures. Or it can simply be a word that is necessary for the moment like this one. Ezekiel was told, prophesy, prophesy, speak the words of the Lord to these bones that they might come together. And so Ezekiel did, verse 7, he says, I prophesied as I was commanded. He spoke the word of the Lord for the moment to these bones. And when he did, he said, as I was prophesying, there was a noise a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them, he says. Fascinating observation here, Ezekiel. The bones came together when he prophesied the words of God. He prophesied to the bones. They came together, but he said there was no breath in them in that moment. Fascinating. A couple of years ago, at one of our district conferences, it was held at Calvary Temple in St. John, New Brunswick, We had our guest speaker from the PAOC West Coast, Bill Gibson, and his wife, Elaine Gibson. And Elaine shared a vision that she had uh, sometime prior to the conference. It wasn't specifically for that conference, but it was was so impactful. It was a wise word, a prophetic word from the Lord. She shared it with us at that conference. And she said this. She said that that revival of hearts of people and, and vitalization of churches is like a train. This is what she saw in her vision. She saw a train... And, in, and the train cars had names on them. Revival of people and vitalization of churches, she said, is like a train. And she saw the train cars. There was a car called, called resources. Of course, people and churches need resources to dig into the word of God, of course. And then there was a car called ministries. And, and then there was a car called personnel and leadership. And there was a car called finances. And all of these things, she said, the Lord was showing her were important in the revival or the vitalization of a local church. They were pillars that support the ministry of a church. They were things that enable people to be built up in the word of God. And then she said, in the vision, it got to the front. And and I think we all know how trains operate. There's an engine at the front. And the engine's pretty powerful, right? The engine's got to pull all of those cars the entire distance. And she said when she got to the engine in her vision, there were two words written on the engine of the train, and the two words were this, Holy Spirit. She said it was the power of the Holy Spirit that revives a church and subsequently a community. A revived church, she says, leads to a revived community. And so we need the cars, we need the compartments, we need the systems and the structure, but they just sit there on the tracks as bones, structures put together without breath until the engine comes to give motion to the whole thing. Let me tie this in with Ezekiel's vision here. See, in the Hebrew language, the word for spirit is ruah. 
In Greek, it's pneuma. And both of these words mean breath, vapor, and also spirit. In fact, in the New Testament, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's the hagios pneuma. I probably got some of that wrong, so don't check a Greek dictionary on me. But it's hagios is holy, and pneuma is spirit. And those are the words that we find there in, in the Hebrew here in, in Ezekiel. It's the Hebrew word ruah. It's a similar passage as we would find in Genesis chapter 2 when God crafted humanity out of the dust of the earth and then he breathed the breath of life into them. What Ezekiel saw was this, folks that he prophesied to the bones. He spoke the word of the Lord to the bones, and they came together. They organized. They had tendons. They had skin. They had structure. But at that moment, there was still no breath there. The job wasn't done yet. There was no life. It's as though they were all dressed up, but still had no place to go. And folks, we can live Life like that. We can live life with all the structures and all the pieces put around us, but lacking movement, lacking the Spirit of God, personally and as a church. We can live personally with all the structures around us, with the best worship music, with, we cleaned our bookshelves. You wouldn't believe how many Bibles we have accumulated over the years. With 45 Bibles on your bookshelves, you can have the devotional book by your bedside. You can come to church each week and have all the structures around us, but we can still, even in that, be like the bones that have assembled but still have no breath and a church too we can have ministries and finances and structures and strategies and boy do I love strategies thank you God for wiring my mind that way I have a glass board in my office you don't even want to read it right now because I need to sift through what's on it and make sense of it. But, but I love strategies and big picture and vision and dreams and all of those kinds of things. But here, even, even at the end of the day, with the best strategies and the best ministry directors and, and the best finances and all of these things, we are like trains on the track that sit there, if not for the breath of the Holy Spirit to come and empower and give life to the things that we put our hands to. I said last week that we can, we can sometimes be guilty of serving in capacities that we know we can. We in Canada, in Yarmouth even, we, we experience a lot of blessings, right? We experience a lot of blessings. And so it's I don't want to downplay the service and the sacrifice that we make, but it's, it's probably within our ability to be generous. And, and we are. We do. But, but we, we do that because the Spirit of God compels us. But people around us can be generous without the Spirit of God compelling them too. And indeed they are. We look around our community and we see, we see that we are generous in Jesus' name, but we see our generosity matched by others as well. We can do things within our ability, but do we, do we dare to dream outside of our abilities? Not even just for resources and, and generosity that, that transcends our, our ability, but for the things that no human can do, like what we prayed for boldly last week. That Marie's back would be made whole in Jesus' name. Not because, and Pastor Aaron prayed, it wasn't even me. Look at that. You see, it's not about the person. I didn't even know until Pastor Aaron told me the next day. Told him, we, gotta get, we, we have to get better at celebrating those things in the moment. And that's not, Pastor Aaron did a fine job. He, Pastor Aaron and Rachel are, are great assets to our church here and appreciate them very much. But here's the thing. Can we, can we, can we ask God to do things that are even impossible for the structures and the systems that we do have and can work within? That's when we start needing the breath of God. It would have been easy, maybe, 
for Ezekiel to get really excited that these dead bones came together and formed something. I mean, how cool is that? Dead bones on the valley floor, they came together, there's tendons, there's skin, they're forming a body. This is amazing. It would have been tempting, if I was Ezekiel maybe, just to jump up and down, celebrate that, put it on Facebook and, and write papers about that and just bask in the miracle that God had done for a good six months. But there's more. There was more than just that. Verse 9, there was no breath in them. We read verse 8. Verse 9, then he said to me, the Spirit of God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Fascinating. Prophesy to the bones first. Now, prophesy to the breath, the ruah, the, the, the spirit. Prophesy to the breath and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain so that they might live. Verse 10, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life, and they stood on their feet, a vast army. Prophesy to the breath, he says. How, how might we prophesy to the breath, or, or the spirit, depending on how we translate that Hebrew word? How might you prophesy to the life giver? How do you speak the word of God to God? Might I suggest... It's exactly that way. We, we speak the word of God, the promises of God, the things that he has promised us. We speak those things not to remind God, but to remind us and to position ourselves in an openness. We recall the promises and the, and the things that God has made. Now, this creates a real problem if we do not know the word of God and if we are not interacting with the word of God. Because if we don't have familiarity with the promises that God has written in this book, then how do we know what to prophesy and what to contend for? How do we know what to press in for? How do we know what God has promised if we do not know the word of God? And, and that, is, that is a grievous thing that, that cuts my heart. Mandy, I, I shared with her this past week, I was marking some assignments at uh, one of our PAOC Bible colleges, I teach a few distance ed courses. And one of the pastors wrote that in his assignment that he's a pastor. He wrote that when we die, we become angels. That, that's, that's not what the word of God says. And so if we are unfamiliar with the word of God, how do we know what to contend for, what to press in for? How can we prophesy to the breath if we do not know what the word of God says? Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, if we want revival, we must revive our reverence for the word of God. If we want conversions, we must put the word of God in our sermons. Even if we paraphrase it in our own words, it must be upon God's word that we place a reliance for the only power that will bless humans. Humanity lies in that. Prophesy the word of God to the spirit. Now, I wish... Ezekiel would have been a little more descriptive here. He just says, so, in verse 10, I prophesied as he commanded. I wish he would have told us how and in what capacity and what he said and how long did he prophesy, perhaps. But we don't know all of those things. But the result was this. Breath came and filled the bones, and they raised up like a vast army. Without the breath of God, they were fully formed bodies, a miracle in itself, hands down, a miracle in itself, but they were still unmoving. With the breath, they were a vast army. Now Ezekiel goes on to share to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament the, the meaning of this vision for the nation of Israel. He said to me, in verse 11, he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy to them. 
This is what the sovereign Lord says. O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you will know, my people, that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. Now, that was the application for Israel, but folks, there's an application here for us today as well. We know that in the book of Timothy in the New Testament, we read that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching and correction and rebuking and, and, and all of those kinds of things. And so there's something useful here in our vision here, in this vision for us here on this fourth, on the fourth state of the church address for us here. Folks, when I, in my first year here, if I had had I don't know, a dollar for every time people told me the Spirit of God didn't move with evangel anymore, you could have subsidized my salary significantly. Now, people don't say that so much anymore, which is good, thank you. It's been three and a half years that I've been around here now, but in the first year, people would say those things. And so I think of that when I think of this, prophesy to the bones Prophesy that God can bring us together and God can restore some of the things that maybe were broken down. We need to guard against just being content with things that we have and content with just a handful of salvations and content with one or two or three bodies being healed a year, kind of like I said at the beginning. We need to guard against just being content and explaining that away. Just We need to guard against being too um, what's the word? Uh, too, too comfortable, or maybe the comfortable is not the word. We need to guard against just being too okay with experiencing lack now, knowing that when Jesus comes, we'll experience the fullness. We know that. But Paul says to the church in Corinth, eagerly desire spiritual things. Let's not give up in our pursuit of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So we need to guard against creating a theology that says it's as good as it gets and the spirit of God doesn't move anymore. Let's buckle up and wait till Christ returns. People said that to me when the first year I was here. What we need to do is not that but prophesy to the bones that we might get up again, that we might, in the strength of God, assemble and, 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 and redig some of the things, some of the structures, some of the systems, some of the ministries that we had forgotten. But then, then, it's not just that. We've done lots of redigging over the last three and a half years as a church. We, we've, we've redug, we've vitalized, we've updated, we've changed. It's... It's been, it's been a fun three and a half years, and we've seen fruit from that. But here's, here's the thing. There's a second part. It wasn't just prophesied to the bones. See, structures come together, and the job is done. Now it's prophesied to the Spirit that it might equip and assemble, equip those assembled bones into a vast army. And so, folks, I can't tell you this morning what kind of timeline the Spirit of God has. Only the sovereign God knows that. I can't tell you how long or what kind of spiritual breakthrough or what kind of things that we will experience in the next season, in the next year at Evangel Assembly, but I can tell you this this morning here in January 2021. I can tell you this, that when a church continually contends with God for more of His Spirit, for more salvations, for more of the supernatural, for more of the promises of God to be fulfilled. When a church does that over time, something happens. Church history assures us of that. I can't tell you how long. I can't tell you when. And I can't tell you what. And I can't even tell you if all of us will see that because some sow and others reap, the word of God says. But no move of God has been sparked any other way but pressing into the promises of God and contending for more of what God has promised. So this year, we are going to ask for more of God's spirit and power in our community, in our region, and in our world. And when we get to February 7th, the State of the Church Address, I'll lay out some actual practical priorities for some of these areas in, in, our, in, our, in our local 
community. That's Yarmouth. That's where we are. This is ground zero for us. This is where we minister and where most of us live. We are going to contend for more of God's spirit here and outside of our walls. And then in our region, the county in the area, the, the tri-county, Southwest Nova, we have a partnership with Eglise du Far in Clare. We assist them with oversight and governance. And, and we're going, they've, they've sent a, a, a big ask, a big request that I said, well, you know, I don't know, but let's, let me, let me just pray about that with Evangel. And so I'm going to share that with you on February 7th as well. And we are assisting with, with Island Gospel Tabernacle on Clam Point as they have a brand new young lead pastor. I think he might even be younger than Pastor Aaron. Is he? You don't know? He's maybe the same age. Pastor Aaron looks older than he is. <laughs> But they have a new young lead pastor, and Evangel Assembly is just beginning to play a role in helping them get settled with their new pastor and move forward. And we have some ways that we can help with that as well as a congregation. And then thirdly, globally, we have partners, global workers within the PAOC that are positioned here and there across the world. And so we can serve, unfortunately not by traveling right now, but we can serve them in other ways. And so we're going to set priorities for those things. So this morning as we wrap up, let's stand together. And I want us to remember these two things from the vision that Ezekiel received this morning. Remember these two things, folks. These are the two things that really, really resonated in my heart. The two parts, prophesy to the bones, the Spirit of God told Ezekiel. Prophesy to the bones, and prophesy to the Spirit. Prophesy to the people, to the structures, to the things that are, that are tired and that are defeating and that are saying the best is in the past and we just need to buckle up and just wait and endure. Prophesy to that and say, but no, the promises of God that we have received have yet not all come to pass. Let's contend for more of that. And then prophesy to the Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill us empower us. And so can we do that this morning? Just take a moment to do that together before we leave. As you pray with me, let's just, you can close your eyes if you like. You can, you can hold your hands in an, in an open position if you like. Just say, Lord, just, just we prophesy to the bones, my bones first, me first. Lord, Lord, I just pray that any, anything that I have believed that is contrary to your word, that diminishes the power of what you can do, I just pray, Lord God, that you will stir and rattle and shake that loose, that you will give new life, new vibrancy to the bones that, that make up my flesh and to the bones that make up the bodies of those who call this their home. And folks, and, and the folks who maybe have been here in the past but are nowhere right now, Lord God, we just pray that you would restore and, 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 and rattle those bones to life again, that they may have, the, have you surrounding them again. We prophesy to the bones what the word of God says. But Lord, we also, we prophesy to the spirit, to the breath. Holy Spirit, Help us to dream bigger than what we can manage on our own. Lord, bring a harvest of souls in our community bigger than we can even manage so that maybe we, we, they don't even all get discipled here at Evangel Assembly because we cannot contain it. But Lord, just pour out your spirit upon our region. Open hearts and unveil hearts that there would be such an outpouring of your salvation. And Lord God, we just pray for an outpouring of things like 
healing and miracles in our region as well, Lord God. And, and we understand our particular position within the churches in our community, that we might be one of the ones who contend for this the most. And we thank you, Lord, that just as your word says that the church is like a body and there's ears and feet and arms, that we can play our part, not out of pride, but simply because out of what you have deposited in us. And so we prophesy to the Spirit, remind you that you said in the Gospel of Luke, though if we are evil, we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will you, our Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so, Lord, as you restore bones to proper function with tendons and muscles and skin, we also pray that you would restore the power of the Spirit to those bones and to us, that we might walk boldly in accordance with your will this year. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for this. In the name of Christ, we pray together. Amen.